God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and and what you've done here. We thank you for this building that we're so blessed to have. We thank you for the church family that we're even more blessed to have, God, that we get to come here and celebrate who you are and just know more about who you are. Holy Spirit, would you invade this place this morning? Would you invade Andy as he comes up here and just give him peace of mind and rest in his heart? Give him the confidence he needs to Uh, Proclaim your word proudly. Uh, Let this all be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Happy New Year. Good morning. Welcome. You're in for a treat this morning, apparently. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks, Ken, for that introduction. That was very helpful to my cause. Um, Okay, let's get these dad jokes out of the way right away, off the top. Let's clear the air. Uh, wow, I haven't seen you since last year. Grown. Yep. All right. One, one more. Just bear with me. Uh, this is a perfect, or this is the year I will have perfect vision because of 20. Good night. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, I almost didn't tell the jokes cause it, just because they were so lame. And I was like, well, I'll give it a shot and see what happens. And they, they went as terribly as they did the first service, so. Good. But sincerely, though, Happy New Year from us to you, from the church, from the staff, from the leadership. Uh, we, we came out of an Advent series where we looked at love and joy and hope and peace, as we do every Advent series. But our prayer is sincerely that we hope, we sincerely hope that you experienced all of those four things and more as you spent time with family and friends and, and everything else. So Happy New Year. Uh, it's, it's a new day of the week. It's a new, it's a first Sunday of the month. It's the first Sunday of the decade. Uh, that's that's the mind blower, honestly. But as we start off this year, we're starting off, as Ken has mentioned, as we mentioned for Sundays leading up to today, we, we're start, starting a Bible reading project, and we're doing this together. Um, and I'll, I want to stop here and, and kind of share maybe my side, and I'm assuming that many of you have experienced this as well. I know I've done it many times, where you start a Bible reading plan for the year, and you start January 1st, and you start in Genesis, and, and we, we all have heard the creation story over and over and over again, and we maybe, maybe get bored by it, and by, uh, but maybe by January 10th, we're done, just because we've, we've heard it already. Uh, and, then, and then the next year, we try again. I'm going to do better this time. And, and we, we, we try again, and we get to Genesis and Exodus, and we've heard it over and over again, and we've grown up with Flanagraph Sunday School illustrations and drawings and stuff, and we just, we know it, and so we just kind of, put it off to the side because we've heard it over and over and over again. For me, uh, I tried many times and then I get to the point where I would either forget or get tired of it or, or whatever, but the real excuse was just, the real reason was just it wasn't a priority for me. That's why I didn't keep it up. I try again, I breeze through Genesis and Exodus and, and again, I, I knew everything, so why do I need to read it again? And then I get to Leviticus and I found that really difficult because how do I apply the 613 Old Testament laws that they had to abide by? How do I apply that to my life? And Leviticus would be a, a, just a, a snooze fest in numbers. Is I'm not good at math, so how am I going to do good at numbers? And then Deuteronomy is a bunch of laws. and everything. Like, it's just, it doesn't apply. And so how do, I, how do I do this? I'm excited for this year. And this is why I'm excited for this year. I'm excited because I'm not alone doing this. Yes, I'm on staff and a pastor at a church, so I probably should read the Bible. But I'm excited because I'm not alone, and I have a church surrounding me doing this with me, hopefully. I have a community, amen, I have a community ready to engage with me, just not here at Sobel, but across North America at least. I have friends reading the Bible with me, and we're communicating, we're chatting, we're asking each other, what do you think about this, and how do you think about that, and what are you struggling with, and I'm not alone. I have a family doing it with me, which is which is phenomenal. Um, this past week, I set up our nine-year-old on our iPad that he uses every day for games and YouTube. And every morning, I said, buddy, do you want to read the Bible with me? Yep. Awesome. He's, he's nine years old. He can read. But when you get to the Old Testament names, even I screw those up. I said, how can we do this? He goes, well, I want to read the Bible. I said, great. So we pull up the, the, the app, on, or the website on the iPad, and he hits play, and he listens to the Bible. He reads along with it and listens to the Bible. 
I, with all the love and respect in my heart, I said this to the nine o'clock crowd as well. If my nine-year-old can do it, I think we can. I think we can do it. We don't need to do it digitally, but we can read our Bible every single day. If my nine-year-old is willing to do it, that pushed me and that challenged me. So how much more should we do that? But we've been trying to talk about it and promote it and explain how easy it is uh, digitally. And I know maybe maybe in this demographic, maybe the digital side of it isn't our strong suit, and that's okay. Our heart is that we just read the Bible together. That we open it up and we spend 20 to 25 minutes a day reading and praying and thinking about it and pondering and letting the word soak in and maybe, maybe letting go of the idea of, I've heard this story a million times before, and maybe opening up our hearts and minds to see what is new in what we're reading. The only thing holding us back from doing this is simply making a decision. Am I going to spend 20 to 25 minutes a day praying and reading and thinking through and deciding to learn and grow in my faith, or am I not going to? It's a question we need to answer. Am I going to read and listen and learn and ask questions? Am I going to investigate? Am I going to talk to others? Am I going to engage in conversation with others, or am I not going to? Long before I came, we decided as a church that we would strive to know who God is and become like Jesus and change our world. Three things that we we live by and we, we preach about and we talk about. And based off of that, I want to share this quick little ant- antidote, story, illustration, whatever the word is. My family is obsessed with cooking shows. And I know the word obsessed is a very harsh and strong word, but it's the only word that I can really use to describe it. We, we, lose, we literally lose sleep watching cooking shows. Uh, 11.30 rolls around and we're just like, just one more episode. Netflix and Amazon Prime, you are the death of me. Um, but we, just one more episode, click, and we start watching it. And I'm, I'm snoring away, and Naughty nudges me, and we need to finish this episode. And I love, the reason why we watch these nonstop is because I love cooking. I, what's, what, someone, someone asked me this past week, what do you do, like, what's a hobby of yours? What's your off time? And I, I don't know, I don't know what I said, but uh, the truth is, is, is cooking. Give, give me bread and cheese and any other ingredient, and I'll, I'll experiment so the cows come home with grilled cheese. Like, I, I love cooking. If you've been here for a while and I've preached as many times as I have, there's always food integrated in the messages. It's a common theme. I love cooking. I love experimenting. I love, I love trying new things. I love trying to sneak in ingredients that our son hates into the food we cook to see if he can taste it and see if he likes it. Because then I can go back and say, well, you just ate cheese. He hates cheese. I put cheese in there. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I <laughs> got you. I love it. If I wanted to become a world-famous chef, I would need to study their style. I would need to study their technique. I would need to watch how they operate. I would need to uh, observe what tools they use, the lingo or phrases they speak, the behavior, how they treat other people. I would need to spend time with them. I would need to ask them questions. I would need to get to get to know them more than just, I saw them once on the TV. That is how you become a world-famous chef. I would have to know them better than I know myself. We are on a pathway to know God. And that's why we're doing this year-long Bible reading plan. Because how can we go into our world, into our town, into our workplace, into maybe even our homes, and become like Jesus to to those people if we don't know what his style is and what his technique is and how he operates and what tools he uses and what lingo and phrases he used? his behavior and how he treated people. Are we spending time with him asking questions or are we, or, and are we getting to know him more than just, I heard him about him once on a Sunday morning? Do we know God and Jesus? And so with that, here we go into day five. Today's January 5th, day five of your reading. I believe it was in Job somewhere. And clearly I haven't read it yet. <laughs> Sorry, I'll do that later on. But there's a ton to unpack in the first five days. We go from Genesis 1 to 11 and Job 1 to 9. That's a lot of information. So we're going to be here for about four hours. Uh, Buckle in, sit tight. There's coffee in the back if you need. There's bathrooms over there as well. I'm not going to be here for four hours. Oh, I need sleep. We go from the creation story to the fall of fall of man. We go from there to the murder of Abel at the hands of his brother. We, We read the descendants of Adam, and that's a whole chapter in Genesis. We, we go into the curse against Canaan, which is Noah's grandson. We read about Noah's descendants and the three sons and the different. Did you, if you read it, did you, did you catch that there's a person named Egypt? I didn't know that. 
there is a son named Egypt. I thought it was a country. Nope. Apparently it started way back then. Side note. I'm going to go on a lot of squirrel tangents just to give you a heads up. We go from there to the Tower of ba uh, Babel, Babel, however you pronounce it. And then, because we're doing chronologically, many scholars stop and say, okay, now Job comes in the picture. And so we, we, t we read about Job for nine chapters. That's just in five days. How do I recap that in 30 minutes? Everyone's terrified. He's going to talk for so long. No, I'm not. Pastor Dave said this. Share what stuck out to you. And so this morning, I want to share with you what I read and what I heard and what I studied. And I'm hoping that this will inspire you and this will help you. Help you. Uh, I know, I don't know, I'm assuming strongly it's going to challenge some of you. Hopefully in a good way. But for me, it was the first three chapters that have been sticking with me. It was the creation of the world. It was the creation of man and woman. It was the fall of sin and the fall and the sin of man. And so right off the top, we'll start off with the creation. Here's what struck me a little interesting. We could spend hours discussing the different theories of whether the world was created in seven days, or as some people uh, lean on the side of the day age theory found in 2 Peter 3, 8, was it created in seven days or, or thousands of years? Because in 2 Peter we read that the day, a day is, as is a, a thousand years. So where do we land? In my humble opinion, if we are going to split off into camps, if we're going to argue or discuss very heatedly <laughs> about this, we may be getting off track. Perhaps the enemy is using that conversation or that discussion to get us off track. Because the point is this, whether the world was created in seven days or 7,000 years, can we all just agree that the king of heaven, the God of the universe, simply created? I love that. Man, you should come to 9 o'clock and do that. The God of the universe created and he designed and he formed and he built what we have. I watch diligently how our son builds Legos. He builds and, and uses Legos with determination and with care and with focus. He spent 45 minutes on Christmas Day building a Lego. And he, he hit a, a, a banister and it all crumbled apart in seconds. And that, oh man, it, it melted. It, it didn't melt his heart. It broke his heart. He was devastated. But with that much determination, focus, and care, and purpose, how much more did God build what we have? When he created the animals and the, the landscape and the chemical compounds that make up who we are and the, in in the, the very confusing insides and how the body works, when he did all that, as Bible-believing Christians, can we just agree that on that? <laughs> Can we just share that good news that we have a God who created everything, who also created us? We read that in Psalm 139. Can we just agree that he created us for a purpose and he created us for a reason and he created us to have relationship with, he created us to have community with, and he created us for us to have community with each other? I think if we can agree on that, we could go far. We continue on in Genesis chapter 2 when we read about Adam in the garden and we see that God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so there's Adam, and he's tending to the Garden of Eden, and God instructs him. Instructs him and in the version I read, in the translation I read, it says that God commands him not to eat anything in the garden except for one tree. Again, a Sunday school story that we've heard probably many times before. If you haven't heard it before, you're going to hear it now. But can we stop there for a second? God says you can eat from any tree. And we read that there are two trees. There's a tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Now, if I'm, if I'm Adam, I'm, I would probably pick the tree of life because I'm either going to live forever or I'm going to know the difference between good and evil. I would like to live forever. Thank you very much. So why did Adam choose the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? But God says you can eat from any tree, just not that one. And we continue on and we find out that they actually do pick the tree of knowledge of good and, good and, good and evil, and I find that very interesting. But what I find even more interesting is that God said, when you eat. That's found in Genesis 2.17. When you eat. It doesn't say if you eat. It says when you eat. So that tells me that God had a plan. That God, yes, God gave Adam a choice. But he knew what Adam would choose. And he had a plan for when Adam would choose what he did. And God was ready with that plan 
when Adam made that choice. And we need to not forget that point because we're going to touch on that later on this morning. But God had a plan and God was ready with that. We continue on to Adam and Eve. And as we've heard a hundred times, I'm sure Adam falls asleep. God takes a rib out, forms Eve, and now we have the first husband and wife and we have the first male and female and they are naked and they are unashamed and they are together. And I want to stress this very carefully. Please do not hear what I am not saying. My goal here this morning and my intent is not to start a debate or open up a can of worms. I'm simply highlighting what we read in Genesis. That we live in a world today where it is not as it should be. That the world today is not as God intended. It's not as he created it to be. That all changed when sin came. That all changed again when he flooded the earth and, and, and reintroduced new life with Noah and the ark. It's as though we took his Lego creation and smashed it on the ground and now we're trying to put it back together. The world we know today grew out of the fall when Adam and Eve made the choice to do what God said not to do. And so we continue on. And when we read Genesis, we read that God created man and woman. We don't read that he made one over the other. We don't read that... He, we don't read that there is submission to each other. There's only submission to God. There's no lording power over the other. There's no fighting to be heard or seen. We read that there are two humans working together in perfect harmony and having perfect communion with God. We read of a God that has such perfect communion with these two people that he walks in the garden talking with them. There's no rituals. There's no sacrifice. There's simple, perfect communion. Until the snake comes along in chapter 3, that's, that was what God's design was for us. To be perfectly together in communion with each other and to be in perfect communion with God. But in Genesis 1.26, we, uh, we read God say, let us make human beings in our image, in, in our likeness, so that they may rule. The key word us is important to think of. God didn't create by himself. He created well, he created with himself because he's one in three, but he created with Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he created in community. Genesis 1.27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Key word being them. Please don't forget that. In Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them. God didn't bless man and say, the verse on the screen, be fruitful and increase in number. I Hopefully it's on the screen. Fill the earth <laughs> and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He didn't say that to man and then say to women, okay, now you cook the food and take care of the children and do the dishes because man's got it. God blessed them together saying, do that. God said, here is everything I've created for the two of you now do it. Take care of it as equals. Take care of it as partners. No one is lording over the other. In fact, he says, I am the Lord over you. If you, if you are, take part in listening to the podcast that we have put out there as well, this is what I heard from it, and I found it very interesting. It's important to note that in this context, the word Lord here is actually God's name. We have come to learn it as Jehovah or Yahweh. But the really interesting thing is that for the ancient Hebrews, this was a very sacred, significant name. One quick fact I found interesting is that the ancient scribes would uh, take a new pen every time they had to write God's name. They'd throw it away, and then when they get to the next time they had to write God's name, they get a new pen. In a world where we, not we, but the world we live in, where people flippantly take God's name and use it for different things. These ancient Hebrews wouldn't write it, his name, without a new pen. I find that very interesting. So what is God showing us here? God is showing us that he's just not the creator and the king of heaven, ruler of overall and everything else, but he's telling us that he is personal with us. He's sharing his name. It's like me going to Gary, since he's close to the front row, I'll pick on him, and he likes to be center of attention. Sure. <laughs> Question mark. Um, it's like me going to Gary, and I don't know, but ladies, I, I don't, 
I'm not a lady, I don't know what you guys do, but it, I know as guys, we often go to people we don't know and be like, hey buddy, how you doing? Or hey pal, or hey guy, or hey man, right? That's, if we don't know their name, or if we forget their name, which I do often, hey buddy, that's not very personal. But if I were to look Gary in the eye and say, hi Gary, how you doing? There's a, there's a, there's a link there. It brings us to a whole different level. And so God isn't looking at Adam and Eve, and he's not looking at us and saying, you're my nameless child who I love. But he's, he's sharing with us his name. He knows our name. There's a level of relationship there. He's meeting us where we are, and he's showing us he wants a deeper relationship than just our maker and our creator. And so Adam and Eve are created in God's image as a team. Together we read in Genesis that we are made bone of bone and flesh of flesh. Both are together working as equals to live in and care for the world God gave them. And then the fall happens. Thank you very much for Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes along. The end result was both Adam and Eve making the choice to eat the fruit, which God commanded them not to. It's a story that we've heard, I'm sure, a number of times over and over. And in all of this, we see more and more of God's character. That's what we're here to do. We're here to learn about, we're here to know God, learn more about him. And so this morning, we see more and more of God's character. If we're created in his image and his likeness, then it stands to reason that we should have some attributes that he has. We should have some, some, some of the stuff that God has, we should have in us. We, some of us think of it as a fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. I'm lacking in maybe one of those, or all of them. But we should have the attributes, and we just need to recognize them and allow God to bring them out of us. As God is creative, we should be creative. Maybe we're not musical or, or artistic, but we are, all, we are all creative in some way or another, and we should allow that to come forth in and through God. We are to work in collaboration with others, just as the Trinity did. We are to work alongside each other. We are to be in community. We are not to be alone. God created us, created us with a community. He created us in a community, and he created us for a community. We are to be personal with each other. God shared with us his most sacred name, and so we are to follow that example and share our name with others and share our lives with others and share our stories and the blessings we have with others. And when sin entered the world, God was merciful. God said, if you eat, you will die. It's pretty plain, black and white. It's in there in Genesis. Did they die? They didn't die physically. It's very obvious. We have billions of people in the world. They didn't die physically. Maybe their spiritual future died, which God had a plan for. But God was merciful. When they sinned, they knew it. And they hid. They were naked. They were ashamed. They were scared. Because they knew what they did was wrong. Yet God called for them. God pursued them. And God loved them. He could have put a, pulled a, a Thanos. I don't know if this is the right crowd for that. Thanos was super, not a superhero, super villain who snapped his finger and ended half a life on Earth in the universe, Marvel, superhero stuff. Anybody with me? He could have pulled a supervillain and killed half the people. Well, actually, at that point, probably everybody. But instead, he showed mercy. How many times have you been upset with a child of yours or a grandchild of yours? Me, probably almost every day. <laughs> How many times have you been upset with, with an offspring of yours and even though you were upset or disappointed or discouraged or frustrated, you knew that the only thing they needed was a hug. And that would calm them down. And we can deal with discipline and we can deal with making things right later on. But right now, that's just, it's just comfort. It's just, just console and just help. Despite their sin, despite their choice to disobey, despite everything that happened, God went looking for them. And God clothed them. He provided. And he showed mercy and allowed them to live. And he clearly states, it's not going to be fun. Life is going to not <laughs> gonna be a good time anymore. But you can live. You're not going to die. And so the question for us this morning is, where do we need to show mercy in our lives? Where do we need to show mercy in our daily living? Maybe in our home or with our, with our loved ones or maybe uh, kids, grandkids, husband, wives, neighbors, work people. Where do we need to show grace and forgiveness and maybe in those moments, rather than taking everything away, provide and meet a need? 
and now the human beings and the future human race are cursed. And we are quick to jump into the pain of pregnancy as a result of the curse. It's one of the golden verses that people always go to. It's Adam and Eve's fault that I have pain when I'm pregnant. I don't have pain when I'm pregnant. For the record, I don't know what, is, what that's like. I don't think I want to know what that's like from what I hear. We, <laughs> we easily remember that we have to work for our food among the thistles and thorns because of the curse. Oh, Adam, because of you, I have to toil all day long. But if we may for a second, can we read Genesis 3.16 where it says, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire, this is to Eve, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Different translations and different versions cause that verse to vary a little here and there, but here's what it does not change from what I read. Your husband will rule over you. God said that as part of the curse. God didn't create us to rule over women. It's a curse that we have to rule over Eve. God did not design any system of patriarchy or matriarchy. His design is that we would be submissive, submissive to him and to him alone. And yet in that submission, he shared with us his personal name. So there's that close relationship. God did not design the relationship between male and female, husband and wife, man and woman to be one or the other. He designed it to be equal. He designed it to be partners. He designed it so that we would work together. What we read here is that it was part of this curse that the husband is now ruling over his wife. For us, for married men, for fathers, for husbands, for uncles, for brothers, for guys, we can all assume, I'll assume, but we can all agree that life would be simpler if the weight of the world was not on our shoulders. We'd probably get more sleep in life if we weren't up at night worrying about you name it. I know I would. We'd all be happier and more full of life if our kids spoke in a proper English accent and said, yes, Papa, to everything that we asked them to do. Life would go smoothly. I'm trying to teach my kid that. He doesn't listen. But the burden of leading, that responsibility, there are many days, I'm sure, guys, that it feels like a curse. And ladies, it, it's part of the curse we read that, that women are fighting for power. They are fighting to be heard and to be seen in the society we live in. They're fighting to have a say and to have a voice. It's a curse that they are physically and emotionally and socially under the male gender. When Paul talks in Ephesians about husbands submit to your wives, he's talking spiritually, that the husbands are supposed to lead the family uh, spiritually as Christ leads the church spiritually. And yes, in a marriage, in parenting, in a relationship, we have different roles. We have different strengths and different weaknesses. Men, we have some strengths. If we can be honest, for one second, women have a lot more. <laughs> but here's the point from Genesis 2 and 3. That God's perfect design was for a perfect partnership. And it was a result of the fall that we lost that. It's a, lot, it's a lot of doom and gloom in 15 minutes. In all of this, we find hope. And in all of this, we find restoration. Because this is where we begin to see how Jesus came to restore us, or at least show us what it was supposed to be like. Jesus came to bring healing and bring creation to its intended order. In Luke 13, 10, we read of Jesus healing a woman crippled by an evil spirit. She's been over for 18 years. She's unable to stand up. And Jesus healed her, simple. What made it even better is that he healed her on the Sabbath, which we all, most of us know that the Pharisees did not like. How dare you work on the Sabbath? In verse 14, we read this. The leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. He said, there are six days of the week for working. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. And Jesus, I'm imagining him kind of biting back a little bit. He goes, you hypocrites. Each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage. I want to stop there and I want to ask a question. How many times have we heard that story and maybe just let it slip by? Oh, it's just another healing that Jesus did. But there's a whole lot of significance there. The first thing is this. Jesus uses the example of the, of the ox and the donkey being bound and tied to symbolically point out that if they spend that much time untying their animal, to bring them to water. How much more should we be concerned about a human being who's been bound for 18 years? And so he heals her. 
The second thing is this. This is the only time that the phrase daughter of Abraham is mentioned in the Bible. Up to this point, it's always been sons of Abraham. The daughters were never mentioned. And to be given the title daughter of Abraham gave her, and really from that point onward, every other woman, value. She is just as worthy to be healed by Jesus than the sons of Abraham. She's just as worthy to be restored to the way she was originally created. Jesus is all about showing people value. He's about equality. And Jesus is showing them in that moment and us today what the original creation is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be healed, serving him, thankful to him, and working side by side. Men and women living, serving with God as Lord, with God as Yahweh. We see this, uh, again, this equality idea of men and women side by side, again in Acts chapter 2, where Peter is preaching to the crowd after the Holy Spirit had fallen, and Peter is preaching and reciting the prophet Joel. He starts to preach and he says, uh, he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. It's a simple phrase, but it's a very powerful one. It's a phrase, it's a prophecy that points to God bringing equality among men and women. That in the last days, we will stand side by side with God over us as we serve, as we minister, as we are being used by God. Not one over the other, but God over us. Jesus came to restore creation to its intended design. He came to restore creation to its intended purpose. And I want to stop there before we move into communion and kind of close this off. I want to stop there for a brief moment and use this as maybe an encouragement if if, you, if you've been finding the daily Bible reading difficult or if you haven't even started yet, that's really okay. It's only day five. <laughs> but this isn't a message to debate egalitarian or complementarian viewpoints. By the way, those are the biggest words I'll use all week. But that's not the point of this. This is simply me sharing what God pointed out to me in the reading this past week. This is what God kind of revealed. Like I said, there's 11 chapters in Genesis that we that we read this week. There's nine in Job. That's a lot to cover. But this journey that we're on this year to read the Bible chronologically from cover to cover, this will only work in your own spiritual life if you do it. If you come Sunday mornings expecting to, to get, get everything you can, it's not going to work. We've got to do it on our own. Like I said from the very beginning, I like to, I don't, I don't base my sermons off of food, but there's always a food theme going on. But if you eat once a week, you're going to starve. We as a church leadership, we have prepared the menu. We've prepped the food. We've made the buffet. We even do takeout. If you have internet and mobile phone, you can access everything from there. You can easily order in and eat from the menu from your living room couch. But eat and devour. There's a ton of information out there. We're trying to make it readily accessible to you. And the more you look, the more you'll find. You just have to start looking and start doing it. And so consider this not a plea, but a very strong encouragement to dig in this week and read. And just don't read, and oh, I've heard this enough, a million times, but read and ask God, God, what am I learning here? What do you want to reveal to me? As we move into communion, I mentioned a number of times leading up to this that things happened, but God had a plan. He allowed Adam and Eve to make a choice, knowing that choice it would make, but he had a plan. And so as the worship team comes forward, if you've been asked to help with serving communion, you can make your way to the table as well. When they make the choice, God showed mercy and didn't kill them physically, but yet sin still entered the world. And we read that in Romans. We read that uh, the consequence of sin is death, yet God had a plan. In all of this that happened in the first three chapters of, of Genesis, God had a plan. And I hope we can find encouragement in this. I hope we can find peace and hope. And I know it can be hard to. I know there's a lot going on in each of our lives. I know that there's discouragement and there's despair and there's depression and there's a feeling of being lost and there's doubt and fear. All these things that distract us from God's plan.
And we don't have to know God's plan. I had a conversation with somebody uh, last night who was asking questions about, <laughs> about Nadia, my wife, and her physical ailments, which I don't think is a secret anymore. The question was asked, is God going to heal her? God can. And the answer back was, well, yeah, we all know that, but will God heal her? And my answer back was, does it matter? I don't know God's plan. I know that God's plan for me, for us as a family, is to worship him and serve him faithfully, whether we're 100% or not. And so is God's plan for her to suffer? I would hope not. <laughs> but can God use the not-so-fun things in life to bring him glory? Absolutely. And so, yes, God has a plan. It's not our job to figure out what it is. It's our job to serve him and love him, if we call ourselves Christians, to serve him and love him as faithfully as we can. That is our testimony to the world. That is our story. That is what brings him glory. When we are suffering and hurting and lost and despairing and depressed, we can still say, God, you're in control. If you hear anything today, hear this. God had a plan from day one. And all these thousands of years later, God has a plan. We will question, and that's okay. We will lose hope. And sometimes we need a guy on the stage to tell us for the first time or maybe for the hundredth time that God has a plan. If you know a little bit about, about my story, you know this. And if you don't, then I'm telling you now, I'm living proof that God has a plan. And I know many of you are in that same position. If you're feeling hopeless, if you're feeling... Ugh, it's the only word I can think of then please hear these words that God sees you and God hears you and God knows you. And God, just like he did with Adam and Eve when they were fearful and, and scared and ashamed and naked, God is looking to show you love and mercy. He's looking to provide for you. He's ready to do all of that. He is pursuing you. He's looking for you. He's walking through the, the garden calling your name. This plan that God has from day one is redemption. This plan, despite how the enemy has tried to ruin it for thousands of years, is life. This plan involves sending his son to come and pay the price for all the sins that had taken place and will take place. This plan involved the death and sacrifice and then the powerful resurrection of Jesus. And this morning, we're going to take a few moments to remember and to celebrate. And so as the worship team leads us, I want to invite you to come and receive communion. And in that moment, will you spend time maybe worshiping, maybe being thankful for a new year, for a new decade, and what God has in store for you in this time? Or maybe come and spend a brief moment just in repentance. God has given each of you this opportunity today to maybe start off 2020 with clear vision. I know it's cheesy. I'm sorry. He's given you today the opportunity to start fresh. The first day of the week, the first Sunday of the year, of the decade. Maybe we do what we can to start it off as best as we can. I'm going to quickly pray, and then I want to invite you to come forward to any of the four tables and spend time in worship and in communion. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time that you've given us to spend time in a community as we worship, as we listen, as we maybe engage in conversation later on. Father God, we just thank you for your son. As we come out of weeks celebrating Christmas and anticipating the arrival of our Savior, God, we are now past that and we are still thankful for our Savior. God, we thank you that you sent Jesus to show us how it should be 
that you sent Jesus to restore us, to bring redemption to our lives and to this world that we live in. Father God, as we continue on this morning in, in celebrating communion, may we spend just a few brief moments celebrating and worshiping, repenting, and starting off 2020 as fresh as we can. Praise all in Jesus' name. Amen.